It took several thousands of years for the world population to grow to one billion. And then in just about 200 years or so, human numbers on the planet grew sevenfold. In 2011, the global population reached the seven billion mark. A little over a decade later, it's nearing eight billion according to UN projections. But for the first time in history, population trends mask considerable differences between countries worldwide. There's extreme diversity in the mean age of countries and the fertility rates of populations. So while the populations of a growing number of countries are aging and about 60% of the world's population live in countries with below replacement fertility of 2.1 children per woman, other countries have huge youth populations and continue to grow apace. What global implications does this varied landscape have on sustainable development? That's the global debate. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tina Jha. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome on this broadcast global experts on the subject. Uh, I have with me Dr. U.B. Samayajulu, statistical demographer and director of Sigma Research. He's also been the former president of the Indian Association for the Study of Population. Welcome, Doctor, to Sunset TV. Thank you for your time. Also, uh, you know, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Gabriel Watt, professor of Japanese studies, Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich. Thank you, Professor, for your time. Welcome to Sunset TV. And uh, let me inform our viewers that Dr. Watt's uh, research focuses on Japan's demographic change, population aging, and international labor migration. And also, immensely delighted to welcome Dr. Prabhat Jha, Professor in Global Health and Epidemiology at the Della Lena School of Public Health, University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Jha, welcome to Sunset TV. Thank you for your time. Absolute pleasure to have you on this platform. Uh, so for the benefit of our viewers, a little brief into the profile of Dr. Jha. He's the founding executive director of the Center for Global Health Research at Unity Health Toronto and the lead investigator of Million Death Study in India, which from 1997 to 2023 quantifies the causes of premature mortality in over 23 million people. So let me begin the discussion uh, with the three eminent panelists who are joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, Dr. Subhai Julu, let me begin the program today with you. You know, for the first time in history, the United Nations says that uh, population trends indicate considerable differences among countries worldwide. Your comments on this, uh, you know, varied landscape, varied demographic landscape that the world today is witnessing. Yeah, thank you, Tina. And uh, my best wishes to my co panelists and uh, congratulations to the Sons of TV for initiating this debate on an important issue relating to the population. We will be observing the World Population Day in just a few days. I think this is the time for us to take a start about the population trends. And you are right, you are right. There are international differences. There are differences between different uh, countries. You know, the from country to country, the situation is changing in terms of demographic transition, the challenges, the issues, and all. The, there are some advantages of the population changes. There are some disadvantages as well. We need to look into that. When you come to a country like India, it is so vast. You know, it is the second most populous country. It is competing with China, and very sooner, you know, we will become number one in terms of population. So, if you can, if you consider India as a whole. There are state level differences. There are regional differences. You know, the South versus North, you know, some of the states like UP, Bihar, and all, you know, the Northern Belt states, where you have different kinds of demographic challenges. You know, with the high levels of fertility, still you are having the problem in uh, states like UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, and all. On the other hand, in some of the southern states like Kerala and all, you have below replacement fertility. And you have issues related to population aging and elderly people, the kind of care the government, the NGOs, and the family as well has to provide to the elderly people to take care of uh, their needs, whether it is health, in terms of health, or social security, or economic security, or livelihood rather. You know, these are the issues in some of the states. You are right. In some of the countries, like Japan and all, where you have aging of the population is taking place, the fertility levels are too low, even to have replacement level, there, you know, the shortage of uh, labor force will be one of the issues. 
and the elderly population and the need for the caretaking and for providing services to the elderly these are the issues there certainly and so, so what are the implications that japan is facing let me go across to dr wall for that dr wall it's your area of research you've written extensively about the changing demography in japan help us and our viewers understand what are the kind of social and economic implications that the country is facing or has had to face over the years since population decline began in the country absolutely yes um japan's demographic aging is proceeding rapidly because of you know all three demographic variables really showing extreme numbers so we have a very low fertility rate a relatively high um um <clears throat> life expectancy and of course uh, almost none uh, uh, no level of uh, immigration to japan so the combination of these three levels really is the problem and that translates into demographic aging and demographic shrinking and in particular the aging and shrinking of the workforce so the, the those active in 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 the workforce uh, meaning for demographers anybody between 15 and 64 um and for japan what we see is that um the the diminishing of the workforce really kicks off political debates that so far have been taboo issues such as for example the question of whether or not japan should be more welcoming to immigrant labor um and so we see these these social taboos these um, political taboos now becoming part of the political discourse because the economic pressure that is induced by demographic change has been growing so rapidly uh, professor, also for the benefit of our viewers, help us understand what has brought Japan to, uh, to this situation. What are the factors behind this population decline that the country has been witnessing for the last several years? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, of course, there is, there is a happy news, right? So medical system has got, gotten better. Um, uh, the medical care system has been improving over the past century. And this means that Japanese people tend to age, they tend to um, age healthy and live long, relatively healthy lives. And the statistics shows that the once you hit your 75th birthday, you're statistically more, um, uh, like sixfold more um, likely to need health care services or long-term care services than those um, age 65 when people would generally transition into retirement age. Um, so that's the happy news. But then, of course, there's a the big question, why do Japanese people tend to have fewer and fewer children? Right now, the total fertility rate in Japan is uh, 1.37, but we see, um, the, we see uh, regional differences. So, for example, in Tokyo, it is only 1.18 um, children that a woman would have uh, on average. Um, and the debate has been out, uh, and I, I think the reasons are manifold, but generally it's a combination of workforce structures, it's um, a lack of, of caregiving institutions like uh, child care um, institutions, um, and generally, sort of the the um, it's it's hard to balance a, a professional career and family building in Japan. So um, those who would rather opt for having a, a professional career, they in, in like the women who would um, opt for having a professional career in Japan, they tend to remain unmarried and childless. Whereas those who would still opt for a family, um, yeah, family building, um, they would usually have a, around two kids. So um, we, we see sort of this, this gap evolving in society that also translates into value changes and that also speaks of, yeah, some, some larger um, trends and developments that a lot of the industrialized countries um, uh, undergo. Absolutely. Um, and this is, and of this course is a the problem that factor. not just Japan has been you know, going through. A large part of Europe is also witnessing similar problems now. Dr. Jha, let me bring you in and try and understand. Even though we're talking about the varied landscape among countries, wherein there are some countries which are witnessing rapid population growth. On the other hand, there are those that are witnessing population decline. But one thing that remains common among both of these sets of countries is the stress on public health systems. We've just been through, uh, you know, uh, the worst health crisis in over a century, the COVID pandemic. How do you see both of these sides reacting and, you know, coping with the pandemic? So both, both these sides, countries that are overpopulated, where overpopulation is a burden, and countries where elderly population comprise the maximum, you know, uh, uh, percentage of their population. 
Well, I think both challenges have to be met by governments. And it starts with the understanding that the so-called demographic transition is quite variable. And India's demographic transition is also quite unique in several ways. First, there's been a remarkable decrease in uh, fertility, so such that now many parts of the country, particularly urban areas, are below the fertility replacement level uh, of 2.1. And that has spurred, because of India's long-standing cultural preference for boys, a major problem with sex-selective abortions, which uh, by our estimates, about 14 million girls have been aborted before birth in the last uh, approximately uh, three decades. And now what does that do? Well, it creates a future cohort where you'll, you'll have a lot more men than women at the ages where marriage and basically social functions start to come in. And that's that's a big demographic deficit in India and in China. It's often not considered is large numbers of men that will grow up without having uh, wives uh, as possible partners. So that's one unique feature. The second feature, which is, I think, quite important for India to understand is, uh, for to understand about India, is the transition on mortality. So on child mortality, there's been remarkable success. It used to be in 1970, about the time that I left India, 20% of Indian children would die before their fifth birthday. Now that's down to below 4% and continuing to decline. But if you look at adult mortality, let's call that briefly death between 30 and 70, 40% of Indian males still die in those ages uh, between 30 to 70. Now that's compared to 20% in Canada. 30% of Indian women at those ages die compared to about 15% in Canada. And within India, you have remarkable variation between different parts. So this, you can get a decade of difference in life expectancy between different parts of India. And those are very much driven by adult mortality, which has not been as discussed and uh, debated uh, as has been child mortality. So those are the unique features to understand about demography. There's this expression that demography is destiny. And in the Indian case, it'll be a unique pattern characterized by both the pressures from that arise from sex selective abortion leading to large numbers of males, but also dealing with adult mortality. And I'll add one more point because this often comes back into thinking about, okay, well, how are we gonna look after the elderly if we don't have enough workers, the UN has defined this as a dependency ratio. But some careful work uh, has examined that once you take into account health adjusted dependency ratio, meaning not just are people um, living longer, but are they living in reasonable health? And if you look at Japan, Japan has actually reasonably um, healthy elder population and therefore a lower dependency ratio um, when you adjust for health. The concern about India is that you'll have both high death rates and a dependency ratio. That means you want, you'll want you have a sicker elder population that need more care and resources. And all of that, to come back to your question, comes to the core of the argument is the chronic underinvestments in India's public health expenditures are now starting to show the effects in terms of not being able to reduce adult mortality sub uh, uh, substantially. Absolutely. So that is where we need to invest he heavily, make our systems resilient to prepare for the future. You spoke about the unique pattern and very interestingly, you know, Dr. Sumai Rajulu, let me come back to you. This unique pattern that at the moment gives India an advantage is the fact that we are the youngest population in the world today. In this fast aging world, India has the youngest population for several decades to come. We will have this advantage of demographic dividend. But the question is, are we, you know, uh, putting it to our gains? Are we, you know, enacting policies which will help us reap maximum benefits of this demographic dividend? Yeah. You are right. You know, India has the 
window of uh, demographic uh, dividend still open for us you know it would be it would be open you know for various states for varying periods you know if we have done the analysis uh, state wise about the duration of uh, you know time that is available for us to take the advantage of demographic dividend it indicates that it varies from state to state but however the point to be noted is that we have the opportunity to get the benefit of demographic dividend honorable prime minister also you know made a mention of that on couple of occasions and but here the point uh, to be noted is that we need to invest heavily on capacity building of the youth you know skill development of the youth you know to what kind of uh, skill set the youth are having and what kind of skill is required in the market in the employment market and then there has to be matching between these two and once the youth are channel their uh, you know skills are developed and to that extent the employment uh, market is also ready you know the demand and supply also has to be taken care of that is another dimension you know the skill development is one aspect and making the youth who are trained sufficiently and efficiently is one aspect the second aspect is employment generation creating opportunities for them to get into employment whether it is whether it will happen through startup or whether it will happen through self employment or will it be through government sector or private sector these are all debatable issues but given the magnitude of the issues that we have we need a policy and program effective program as well because you know 65% of our population is below 25 years uh, below 35 years and 50% of the population is below 25 years huge chunk of population is available but we have to invest wisely and we have to take care of the skills that are required for these people so that you know they they can be used in the employment market and production can be enhanced and it will also have implications on the economy of the country absolutely as a whole. so domestically That there are the, of course several efforts being undertaken to generate employment create jobs for you know uh, the millions of youth who actually have begun to join the workforce but dr watt since we are talking about the larger global picture so we have this varied uh, landscape very unique for the first time in history as per the united nations india has the youngest workforce the developed countries where the population is declining have the market they require this young force can the to put together you know turn this crisis into an opportunity i think that would definitely be possible right and and migration studies um has many many research uh, really um put forward with regard to the question of you know what would happen if all the borders um were just gone if people were free to move from one place of the earth to another um and as we know 90% of uh, global migration has something to do with labor so it's either that Uh, somebody takes up a job in some other place or somebody is a family member um traveling on um but 90% of migration flows already today are in the context of labor um the problem just is that many of those countries that are classical destination countries um that is those countries that are aging um where there is a lack of labor force um many of them such as Japan they tend to be very hesitant uh, toward an open door migration policy because there is so many um yeah uh, political and societal fears um involved with this idea of opening the borders and having sort of an uncontrolled number of workers uh, coming to those countries and that is for example why Japan or Japanese politicians i should say correctly um are very hesitant about actually talking about immigration just to talk about this word alone um is is a kind of a risky political endeavor in Japan so what you would hear is uh, something like uh, Japanese politicians saying okay we are opening our quota for international trainees from neighboring countries to come to Japan learn new technologies etc and bring those eventually back to their home countries in terms of a global spill over and sort of a japanese contribution to international development or assistance so there is all kinds of narratives that try are a sort of put forward in order to make clear that now no we are not talking about immigration whereas in reality what's happening of course is immigration albeit i have to say the the number of people let in countries such as japan on various 
um, migration avenues, various schemes, um, th that's just simply too few. Um, one example really is elder caregiving, which of course is in the middle of uh, you know, demographic change on both ends, right? So there is going to be more and more demand for elder caregivers in Japan, um, and professional elder caregivers. And on the other hand, there are professional elder caregivers who would want to come to Japan. And Japan actually has bilateral agreements with the Philippines, with Vietnam and Indonesia that allows for the transition of elder caregivers from these countries to Japan, but then the quota is so low, we're actually just talking about 1,000 persons per nation per year. Um, and you know, juxtapose that with a lack of 70,000 um, elder caregivers that Japan would need to, um, to recruit every year. Um, this, this just doesn't make any sense. And I think, you know, economically, everybody knows this, that yes, indeed, open borders would be a solution to this demographic imbalances on a global scale. But the problem lies with the um, non, um, yeah, it, it, there is no political will. And, and there is, is kind of a fear of uh, societal backlash. If, absolutely, if absolutely. Really the, the, these, these are not existential threats. These are challenges uh, for which solutions will have to be found. The developed world, the developing world has to come together to find solutions. And in that aspect, uh, Dr. Jha, in this rapidly changing demography globally, what is the kind of opportunity that we have to create together to build more inclusive, uh, more diverse, and most importantly, more healthier society globally? Uh, for India in particular, uh, the lessons are that uh, from countries that have taken advantage of their demographic dividend have invested in human capital. So along with what uh, my colleague mentioned about uh, education opportunities and creating um, uh, work op opportunities for young people, there needs to be a commensurate investment in health. If you look in India, 50 million people, five crore people fall below the poverty line every year because of catastrophic health expenses. They just cannot afford to pay for the expensive treatment at private hospitals, and they have to basically go into poverty or borrow money. That is a big break on human capital development and taking advantage of the demographic dividend. So I think a serious discussion about how India could truly be a 21st century uh, superpower in terms of taking advantage of its younger population. The fact that it has a uh, the population growth is uh, is going to continue by the UN estimates till 2050, till a, till about 1.6 billion people, and then stabilize. And that's actually sustainable from one perspective. Certainly from food security, it's sustainable. India has shown that with the green revolution that it can't feed its own. But the other elements that are needed are very much to ensure that there's equitable, uh, equitable distribution of opportunity. And the heart of that is to invest in the social safety net in terms of education, in terms of health, and broadly in terms of thinking about uh, old age pensions. Those discussions in India are just getting started and they're, I think, too immature currently um, versus where the ambitions of Indian, certainly the Indian Prime Minister's ambitions are not commensurate with the investments in health and education that have been made to date. But, you know, the fact that it's actually being uh, undertaken, the efforts uh, have begun to take place, despite the fact that our huge population is training our limited resources. There is the safety net that you've spoken about. There have been efforts to actually bring about the below poverty line uh, people under, uh, the, you know, the public health coverage. Things have yeah. begun to change, but there is no doubt that... Uh, the demographic dividend window is limited and there is limited time uh, under which we have to adapt the global best practices. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel, coming back to you to understand because Japan must have been in this state of demographic advantage uh, that India currently has. So what, what is it that, that Japan did? Although, of course, there is no similarity because of, uh, you know, the huge population that India has. But some of the best practices that India can adapt to take care of these shortcomings that Dr. Jha spoke about. 
think probably the, the main lesson that, that could be learned from Japan is, um, is to how to manage the growth of the population. Uh, I think Japan is no longer trying to sort of counteract uh, the demographic trend, uh, meaning the, the aging and the, the shrinking of the population. But the question really is how to manage it. And, um, you know, there are the, the obvious things, such as investing in, in long-term care, in pensions, et cetera. But I think the remarkable and probably unique approach that Japan has been following is to really <clears throat> try to mobilize people uh, and try to mobilize social capital. And that is what Japan has really been doing at an extraordinarily good level. Um, meaning that, you know, um, go, go really to the neighborhoods and uh, see what kind of existing structures there are. In Japan, there is a, like a nationwide network of neighborhood associations that bring together um, the elderly, the women, the school kids, etc. And um, what Japan has been doing is to, to create incentives for these neighborhood associations to make sure that the social networks are being knit even tighter. And that is, for example, um, kids from middle school age, from ninth grade um, on. These days, they are now sort of having, having a, a class in, in the curriculum that is called social services. So kids would spend an hour per week um, working um, as a volunteer in their community, meaning that they, for example, do the shopping for a, an elderly lady who, who cannot uh, carry the heavy shopping bags on her own anymore, etc. And so these are small things, but really it is what it is about is that kids from a very young age are being trained um, to become volunteers. And, and that is something that is uh, having a huge potential in Japanese society. And it is now being structuralized and mobilized through things such as a school curriculum. Um, in other words, while the social welfare state in Japan really is retrenching because there is just simply too much demand um, for, for all the, uh, the things that probably in the 1970s the state would still have um, handled. Um, so while the welfare state is retrenching, at the same time, it is engaging citizens to become more active themselves and to take care of their neighborhoods. Um, and on top of that, there is also numerous programs that try to make sure that the elderly um, age healthily. And um, a, a very strong point there is campaigns, governmental campaigns for lifelong learning. Um, that is, um, the, the government with these campaigns really tries to make sure that people, um, they, they are still part of the community. They go out, they, they um, you know, volunteer themselves, or they, they make sure that they take part in cooking classes or, um, you know, uh, still, um, yeah, also help uh, the community so, by, several, for example, Several areas and several best practices that India could look up to, you know, in terms of what Japan has, uh, you know, uh, done earlier uh, before India and several other countries in Europe as well, but also learn from the mistakes, perhaps, that these countries uh, may have done in the process, uh, which perhaps has brought them to this, uh, you know, uh, demographic uh, catastrophe, which some are also talking about, say, because of the implications, the economic implications, particularly that an aging population may have on the country's growth. So that having been said, I'll have to wind up the discussion. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program today, sharing your thoughts, your views, your perspectives with us and our viewers. Absolute pleasure to have you on the program today. So that's it from us, uh, viewers, on this edition of The Thank Global you. Debate. Thank you for your time. See you again same time next week. Until then, take care of yourselves and keep watching Sunset TV.